sodiums. Well, how about how about some sodium chloride? How much sodium chloride do we need? Well, I I I guess we need ten of them. About ten sodium chlorides. Okay, so now sodium is balanced. We've got ten carbons and ten carbons. Oxygen's already balanced. And we have two potassiums over here. Two potassiums? Where's the potassium going to go? Well, it's got to go with chloride, I guess. So how about two potassium chlorides? Now let's see if our chloride is right. We've got 16 chloride ions over here on the left. We have four here, two here, that makes six, and ten here makes sixteen. Guess what? It's balanced. Now, we're ready to work the rest of the problem. Let's take our 25 milliliters of our potassium permanganate times 0 0.0233 moles per liter times the stoichiometric ratio, which is 5 over 2, to get us over to the sodium oxalate, times liters over 0 0.0199 mole. Now let's cancel units. Moles and moles cancel. Liters and liters cancel. And we should come out in milliliters. And I get for an answer to this, 73.18 milliliters. It's a really good problem. Oxidizing and reducing agents. Folks, how can you predict when something is going to be an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent? Well, there are several factors that are involved here. But let's start out by reviewing the range of oxidation states for the representative elements. That'll be a good starting point. Get a periodic table. Look at it. Now, for the 1A elements, what are the common oxidation states or the common range of states for them? 0 or plus 1. Granted, hydrogen can be a negative 1. But for the rest of the 1As, it's 0 or plus 1. What about the 2As? What are the oxidation states for that? Well, they are generally 0 or plus 2. The 3As, what are those? They generally, the 3As run from plus 3 to negative 5. Now, we went through all of that earlier in this course, so remember it. But this is a time to review, so it can be anywhere from plus 3 to negative 5. Plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and negative 5. What about the 4As? Well, the 4As, that carbon family, run anything from plus 4 to negative 4. Plus 4, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. You've got it. The 5As from plus 5 to negative 3. From plus 5 through 0 to negative 3. The 6As from plus 6 through 0 to negative 2. The 7As from plus 7 through 0 to negative 1. There are some things you need to keep in mind when you're trying to decide whether or not a particular compound or an element could be an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent or either. Remember, oxidizing agents gain electrons. Therefore, the only things that can act as oxidizing agents are those things that are capable of gaining electrons. Another thing is reducing agents lose electrons. So the only thing that can act as reducing agents are those things that are capable of losing electrons.
Consider iron, for example. Now, the common oxidation states of iron are Fe at zero when it's an element, Fe with a plus two charge, and Fe with a plus three charge. Are there other states that are, are, are var very much less frequently occurring? Very possibly, but we're only looking at the common states. Can Fe with a zero charge act as a reducing agent? In other words, can elemental iron act as a reducing agent? Now think about it. And the answer is, certainly it can. Why? Because Fe can lose electrons to form either the ferrous ion or the ferric ion. Okay. Well, can Fe0 act as an oxidizing agent? And the answer is, not likely. Why not? Do you know of a case in which iron, as the element, gains electrons? Well, consider the ferric ion and ask yourself, can the ferric ion act as a reducing agent? Can the ferric ion act as a reducing agent? Can the ferric ion lose some more electrons? The answer is no. Why not? Well, it's already lost all the electrons normally possible, and we're not going to those extreme states. We're only dealing with what is normally possible. Well, can the ferric ion act as an oxidizing agent? And the answer is, can it gain electrons? Certainly. It can form the ferrous ion or metallic ion, either one. Now consider the ferrous ion, the Fe plus 2, and ask yourself, can the ferrous ion act as a reducing agent? Can the ferrous ion lose electrons? The answer is yes, it can. How? Because it can lose an electron to form the ferric ion. Okay. Well, can the ferrous ion act as an oxidizing agent? Can it gain electrons? And the answer is certainly. It can form iron with a zero charge. Are you beginning to get the idea? Well, we need to look at this in a little bit more extensive way, but this is, this is the beginnings of your process. To summarize this before we go on, if an element or an ion is at one extreme of its oxidation state range, it can only change in one direction. If the, if the range for iron was, for example, only that it could be 0, plus 2, and plus 3, and if it was a 0, the only thing it could do would be to lose electrons. Well, you get the idea. If an element or an ion is somewhere in the middle of the oxidation state range, then it can go in either direction. A few pointers. The pointers come with the polyatomic ions. If you're looking at a polyatomic ion, such as permanganate, don't consider oxygen. Just consider the manganese. In this case, the manganese, which is a plus 7 charge. The only time you consider oxygen is when it is present as a peroxide or as O2 when it's present as a peroxide or O2. It's very rare that you're going to find oxygen changing from a negative 2 to one of the lesser states. It's not, not to say that it's not possible. It's just not one of the really likely ones. Stay within the common oxidation state range unless you're given some other information. So those ranges that we've talked about, stick in there. We're getting ready to apply all of this by building a table that looks like this. We're going to go through and using the information and the ideas that we've been talking about, we're going to fill out this table. So you need to go back and review everything, make sure your notes are clear. And in the next lecture, we will start off by building and completing this table.
a better way to teach and learn chemistry. Oxidation Reduction, Lecture 3. Now, here's your table. The left side is filled out, but we're going to take it one item at a time. Let's start with the, chlorate, the perchlorate radical. Now, the perchlorate radical has oxygen with a negative 2, and what is the charge on chlorine? It's plus 7. Can it act as an oxidizing agent. Can it gain electrons? And the answer is, yes, it can. The chlorine can gain electrons. Well, when it gains electrons, what does it change to? Well, it can change to the, the, the chlorine can gain electrons, and it can change to the chlorate radical, or the chlorite radical, or the hypochlorite radical, or chloride, or chlorine. There are a lot of things it can change to. Well, can the ClO4 minus, the perchlorate radical, act as a reducing agent? In other words, can it lose some more electrons? Remember, don't count oxygen in this now. And the answer is, nope, nothing that we would recognize. All right, look at this. How about the element magnesium? Will the element magnesium gain electrons? Well. Have you ever seen magnesium with a negative charge? So not in the common things that you know. Well, what about as a reducing agent? Well, in other words, will magnesium lose electrons? Yeah, there it is, magnesium with a plus two. Okay, how about hydrogen peroxide? Ah, now here you have hydrogen peroxide and oxygen has a negative one charge. Can it act as an oxidizing agent? Can it gain electrons? Oh yes, it can go to oxygen with a negative two charge in either water or hydroxide ion. Well, what about its product as a reducing agent? Can it lose electrons? Can the oxygen and peroxide, which is a negative one, lose electrons? And the answer is sure, it can form O2. Are you getting the idea? Let's go to another radical. Let's look at dichromate, Cr2O7, negative 2. Stop for a minute and figure the oxidation states of things here. And the oxidation state of oxygen is negative 2. And what about the chromium? It's a plus 6. Can chromium gain electrons? At plus 6, can it gain electrons? And the answer is yes, it can. And it can form things like the chromic ion, the chromous ion, or chromium, in the elemental state. Well, can chromium at a plus six lose electrons? And you will say, not that I know of. All right, let's go to a compound. Let's look at manganese dioxide. Oxygen's a negative two there, and what's manganese? It's a plus four. Can manganese gain electrons? It's a plus four. Can it gain them? Yes, it can go to manganous ion or manganic ion, either one. Can manganese at a plus four lose electrons? Think about your range of oxidation states. And the answer is yes, it can. It can go to a plus seven, like in permanganate. If you, if you need to catch up, then pause your video for a moment. Let's look at the nitrate radical. Here you have oxygen with a negative two and nitrogen with a positive five. Nitrogen with a plus five. Can it gain electrons? Yes, there are lots of things. Lots of these different compounds. Lots of these different structures. And of course,
course, there's such things as the NO2 radical. There are several things it can produce as an oxidizing agent. Well, what about when nitrate acts as a reducing agent? Can it act as a reducing agent? Can it lose more electrons? Not in the common sense of things, not in the common state of things. Okay? How about this element, chromium? Can chromium act as an oxidizing agent? Can it gain, can it gain electrons? Not that you know of. Can it lose electrons? Oh, yeah. Can you think of something? Do I have it in the list? There are other things, too. Besides these, I have there's dichromate, for example. What about iodine? Iodine. Can iodine act as an oxidizing agent? In other words, can iodine gain electrons? You say, sure, it can form an iodide ion. Can iodine act as a reducing agent? Can it lose electrons? Oh, yeah. It can form those oxides that you form, those radicals. Yeah, those are all has positive charges in those. What about an old friend, the ferrous ion? Can the ferrous ion act as an oxidizing agent? Can it gain electrons? The answer is yes, it can, and when it does, it can form Fe0. Well, can it act as a reducing agent? Can Fe plus 2 lose electrons? Sure, it can form the ferric ion, and for example, it could form Fe2O3, in which you have a plus 3 charge for the ion. The iodate radical. Oxygen's a negative 2. What's iodine here? That's right, it's a positive 5. What can it form? It can form iodine or the iodide ion. So it can gain electrons and form either of these, for example. These are not necessarily all-inclusive. What can it form if it were a reducing agent? If it were a reducing agent and lost electrons, what could it form? How about how about IO4 with a negative charge in which iodine has a plus 7? Have the idea? Was this a good exercise? These are not things necessarily for you to, to memorize. These are just things to help direct you in your way of looking at the ability of, of various compounds or elements or radicals or whatever to perform as oxidizing agents. Or now we're ready to look at voltaic cells. Voltaic cells. Just what is a voltaic cell? Well, a voltaic cell is a spontaneous oxidation reduction reaction that when it occurs can produce an electrical current. Now, you remember this, don't you? Remember the activity series? There it is. You recall how it works? Do you recall that an element replaces an ion below the element? Well, we're going to look at that in a way, but we're going to look at it in terms of half cells. Let's look at the all-important Danielle cell, the zinc-copper ion cell. Look at this reaction. You have zinc plus cupric sulfate, giving you zinc sulfate and the precipitating copper. This is done in solution. Now, when we write this as a net ionic equation, we have this. We have zinc plus the copper ion, producing the zinc ion plus copper element. When we do this in half cells, oxidizing half cells and reducing half cells, the reduction half cell has zinc going to zinc ion plus two electrons. And copper in the other half cell gains two electrons and produces elemental copper. But here's how it's going to look. We have cupric sulfate, we have a zinc bar in the beaker. We take the copper sulfate, cupric sulfate, and we put it 
into a, a beaker and we put in our zinc bar and notice it almost immediately changes colors. You almost immediately are getting precipitation of some kind forming on that zinc bar. And if we leave it, leave it sit for a while, then we find quite a large deposit. And notice the blue color is getting lighter in that solution because the copper ion is coming out of it and precipitating as elemental copper all along that zinc plate. Zinc is forming zinc ions plus two electrons. The cupric ion from the copper sulfate is picking up those two electrons and forming copper metal. So that our overall reaction is zinc metal plus copper ion forming zinc ion plus copper metal. Now, how can we use that and make it provide electricity for us? Well, we can do it on something sort of like the dry cell battery. Now, this doesn't use the same exact reactions that we're talking about but it is the same kind of a process. In a dry cell battery, you've got a carbon rod going down through the center of it. Reduction occurs in that carbon rod. You've got a zinc cylinder, and oxidation occurs in that zinc cylinder, and that carbon rod and the zinc cylinder don't touch each other. All that packing material inside is, is something that will that is able to conduct an electrical current. Now, take that and you attach it to something like your calculator. You've separated the half cells, but you have allowed the electrons to flow. You can get a complete circuit and power your calculator. And that is the basics of the way that a dry cell battery works. Let's look at it now when we separate the two. On the left, we have a solution of zinc sulfate with a zinc plate in it. On the right, we have a plate of copper and or a copper strip, and we have that in a cupric sulfate solution, that blue solution. Now, what is going to happen with this? We have a salt bridge that connects the two here and a voltmeter here that's able to read the current when electrons flow through. Here's the way it's going to work now. The zinc is going to lose electrons. And when, the, when it loses the electrons, the electrons are going to flow over through to the other side where the copper is going to pick them up. Now, when the copper ion picks up those electrons, you have a deficiency of negative charge on the left and a sufficiency of negative charge on the right. So sulfate ions go over the salt bridge and even out the charges. And that's the way you complete the circuit. And that is a similar kind of thing to what is going on in the dry cell battery. But there's a question. Why does this reaction work, the zinc plus the copper ion producing zinc ion plus copper? But when you try this one, putting copper into the zinc ion, you get no reaction. Well, there's a chart that you need. And you're going to find it in a, in a textbook, and you're going to find an abbreviated chart in this note guide. It's a table of standard electrode potentials at 25 degrees Celsius. So turn to it either in this note guide or in a textbook. Just pause this video and find it and have it available as we go through and do this next part. Here is a table of standard reduction potentials. I greatly reduced the size of this table so I could get it on the screen and talk to you a little bit about it. It's written as standard reduction potentials. So things are written in terms of, in order of their ability to gain electrons. And fluorine has the greatest tendency to gain electrons. It is, after all, the most electronegative element. And when fluorine gains electrons and becomes the fluoride ion in an aqueous media, 
it generates or it produces 2.9 volts. Everything else below it, everything else is of a lesser ability to act in that manner. This is your strongest oxidizing agent. That's fluorine. Everything else on this side, when it reacts this way, is behaving as an oxidizing agent, but is weaker than fluorine. Fluorine can force anything below it and on the right over here, anything below it and on the right, to react. It will take the electrons away. For example, you put fluorine with gold. The gold will lose the electrons and become a gold ion. You put fluorine with bromide ions. Fluorine will take the electrons and drive bromine the other way. Kind of get a handle on how it works. Something up on the left will react with something down on the right. Now I want you to look at this right here. This one that is zero is your hydrogen electrode. It's hydrogen and platinum and it has a voltage of zero. What do, why do we say that? We say that because we had to have a standard to use. So we set this up as our standard, and everything above it has a positive voltage, and everything below it has a negative voltage. Now where is your strongest reducing agent? And the answer to that is, it's down here, it's over here, right here, yeah. That one right there is your strongest reducing agent. I'll explain a little bit more about how this works, and I will develop it a little bit more in the next few slides. I want you to look up some half reactions in the table that is either in the back of your note guide or in your textbook. Here's the first one. Cupric ion AQ. Cupric ion in in solution plus two electrons giving you copper. Now look up the voltage. What do you get? Jot it down. This is what I get, plus about 0.34 volts. I've rounded off some. Now that's one of them. Now I want you to look up zinc solid forming the zinc ion in solution plus two electrons. What is that voltage? Now look at the way I've written it. The copper half cell we wrote gaining electrons. The zinc half cell we write losing electrons, so you've got to look it up on the other side of the column. And when you do, you've got to reverse the charge on the voltage, and you'll find it's going to be plus 0 0.76. Therefore, when you add up these two reactions and their voltages, you're going to get zinc metal reacting with copper ion, giving you zinc ion plus copper metal, and the voltage is going to be 1.10 volts. Anytime you can add the half cell potentials and get a positive voltage, that reaction is going to occur spontaneously. If you add up two half cells and get a negative voltage, then you have to input power to get the reaction to go that way. It's spontaneous in the other direction. What if we have these two reduction half cells? We have the ferric ion and, and aqueous gaining electrons producing the aqueous ferrous ion, and the voltage is 0 0.77 volts. And the bromine gains two electrons, forms two bromide ions, aqueous, and that voltage is 1.07 volts. Now, look at these. I've written them both as if they're gaining electrons. One will have to gain, one will have to lose. But which way do you write it? Well, let's look. Is it this way? Well, is this the way it will go spontaneously? Well, if we take the ferric ion plus electrons, giving us the ferrous ion, and the bromide ion, giving us bromine and two electrons, then our net voltage is negative. Do you see that? We had to change the sign on the bromine half cell because we wrote it in the other direction. So this isn't going to work. But what about this? What if we write the ferrous ion with, gain, with bromine 
producing the ferric ion and two bromide ions. And we take the, we add up the voltages of that and it's plus 0 0.30 volts. Now that is the reaction that will go spontaneously. Do you see how this works? We will do a much more extensive treatment on this in the second half of this course. But there's some things we need to address here to give you some good background. Which half cell has the greatest reduction potential? And that's this one right here. And since it has the greatest reduction potential, then it's the one that's going to gain the electrons. The order of the half cells, and this is important, the order of those half cells, how do we devise that whole table anyway? The order of the half cells becomes bromine plus two electrons producing the bromide ion and the ferric ion plus an electron producing the ferrous ion. And when you put the two together, this one will go that way and that one will go this way. And that's how you can add them up and get a complete reaction with a positive voltage. Consider this reaction. We have chloride ion reacting with permanganate, giving us the manganous ion and chlorine. Now here are the half cells that we get. Here are the half cells. We have, we write them, remember, gaining electrons. So we write chlorine plus two electrons, giving us chloride ion, and permanganate plus five electrons, giving us the manganous ion. Now, which one has the greater reduction potential? Which one goes the way it's which one goes the way it's written? Look at your equation. That's what happened. Which one then is the higher one? This is the way in which they should be written. Permanganate plus five electrons. The permanganate gains five electrons easier than the chlorine gains two electrons. That's how we get their positions in the table. Imagine the hours chemists spent putting things together and seeing what would work and what wouldn't to try to come up with these kinds of things. Try this series. We have iodide ion reacting with bromine, producing bromide ion plus iodine. That's what we observe. That's the reaction that occurs. Now, there are two half cells involved. Let's put them in order of reduction potential. Here they are. Iodine gains two electrons, producing the iodide ion. Bromine gains two electrons, producing the bromide ion. Now, the which one is going to go that way? Which one is going to gain the electrons? Well, you look at the reaction and you say, the bromine is going to gain the electrons. Sure, the bromine has the greater reduction potential. So it belongs on top. Look at this series of reactions. Now here are four. Let's see if you can do them. We have two iodide ions plus bromine producing bromide ion plus iodine. That's one reaction. Then before we put the iodide ion with the ferric ion, we get iodine and the ferrous ion. When we took the, put the bromide ion with the ferric ion, we don't get a reaction at all. And when we put the cuprous ion with iodine, we get the cupric ion plus iodide ion. Now, I want you to place these half cells in order of, re of reduction potential, from the greatest reduction potential to the lowest reduction potential. Pause this presentation while you work, and let's get it in there. And here are the half cells you're dealing with. You're dealing with Cu plus 2, iodine, bromine, and the ferrous ion. Now, pause this presentation and take those half cells, and based on those four equations, put them in the proper order. Then bring the, bring the program back on, and I will show you what I did. Here's the proper order. Bromine plus two electrons producing bromide ions. The ferric ion plus an electron producing the ferrous ion. Iodine plus two electrons giving you the iodide ion, and copper plus two plus an electron giving you the cuprous ion. Now, got it? 
Do you see why it's that way? This is what you should have come up with. Now, use that series right there, that reduction potential series, and predict these reactions. Predict this one. If I were to put ferric ion with the cuprous ion, would I get a reaction? Yes, I would prefer.